Another potential top Pentagon employee is stepping away from a possible role in the Trump administration. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis withdrew his choice for Undersecretary for Policy, Ann Patterson, after the White House indicated an unwillingness to fight what it said would be a battle for Senate confirmation. David Chu is president of the Institute for Defense Analysis. David, for two months into the Trump administration, how unusual is this, if it is at all? Well, it's usual to have a gap. Uh, it's not, perhaps, usual to have this big a gap. Uh, I would reassure viewers, the department will function effectively in this situation because there are many terrific career civil servants who step up as acting uh, persons. But the issue really is, what's the cost of this gap? And you create a certain amount of uncertainty with the gap because who knows exactly what the new appointees will emphasize in carrying out the President's Secretary of Defense's direction and the Congress's uh, instructions. Uh, and there's also a, a, a burden on people. Uh, you're shorthanded. So some people are doing two jobs. Or put it another way, some people are not paying attention to the lower priority amounts of their former position and they're now in this acting capacity. And so when they go back to that position, they've got this backlog to deal with. Uh, so there are, there are costs to uh, the gap, the delay that is occurring here. And in the service branches alone, um, we have Air Force Secretary a name put forward, not right. confirmed. Picks for the Army and Navy secretaries have also withdrawn for consideration. How difficult will it be for the folks down the ladder at these agencies to go on with business as usual? Well, again, uh, you have a great career cadres, and of course in the services you have the uniformed personnel who will step in in the acting role. But they will be reluctant, in my judgment, to take uh, very significant long-run actions because they're waiting for instructions from the appointees who are, will be named eventually and, and I assume confirmed by the Senate. And so that's a delay. Uh, that's a period in which you don't necessarily invest in the future in the way you should. Uh, it's a challenge. Sure. And switching gears a little bit, there's been talk of major Pentagon reform by the Defense Secretary. Yes. Um, you know, as the details start emerging from this, um, logistics. Let's talk a little bit just about what this sort of a reform would take. Well, there's several s ways in which you could interpret reform in terms of Secretary Mattis' agenda. One is what he said in the first day of office, uh, which is a little bit different tone from some of his predecessors, and that is an emphasis on the ability of our forces to fight today. Readiness, as people call it. And that does touch on logistics, because as people often observe, true strategists talk about logistics. Can I get the forces to the fight in time? Can I supply them once they get there? Or can I give them the kind of special capabilities that make them uh, successful? But he's also pursuing reform in response to the Congress's instruction. The Congress has, rearranged, has directed the department to rearrange how it deals with the whole set of issues under the acquisition banner. That includes logistics. It is told to return to a structure it had in the 70s and early 1980s, which had its problems in that decade. So the challenge for Secretary Mattis is, if this didn't quite work right before with this new congressional instruction, how do I make this successful going forward? And finally, he's concerned with efficiency, which again comes back to logistics. Uh, a lot of the department's expense is in the cost of supporting weapon systems, business processes, how we do contracts, who performs. So one of the big issues out there is the role of the private sector versus government depots in performing logistics uh, functions. Thorny issue. A lot of politics attached to it. And in terms of personnel, who, who's involved? Who are the stakeholders? Oh, the stakeholders in logistics issues range widely. So primary stakeholder is the American taxpayer, because ultimately these forces need to be effective in the field for American, in protecting American interests. And so what, the first question is, how well does the system perform in carrying out the military mission? And that's, in some sense, the secretary, military leadership, civil leadership of the military departments, they represent those taxpayers and, and the case for effective performance of logistics functions. But you also have those who are now performing that function. Those who might hold the contracts, those who are working in government facilities. They will be concerned with any change in those arrangements, whether those change about the nature of the contracts. For example, logistics has been enthused about so-called performance-based contracts. In other words, how your pay based on how well the thing works, not just on what you did each hour uh, in terms of your 
in terms of your uh, function. And the communities around the facilities where logistics activities take place, which are dependent on those payrolls, they are another stakeholder group. They are not likely to be enthused about changes that would affect the level of employment. If it's downward, if it's upward, everyone applauds. Downward, not so big. David, thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure to be here.